to be in the house of God today? How about on this side? Is anyone here that says, or maybe watching online, that says, I just have to open my mouth and I just have to celebrate all that God is doing in my life. I am so excited that you guys have chosen to join us today. I'm glad you're in the house. I'm glad you're watching online because I'm telling you right now that I am thrilled to be able to deliver a message that I believe that God has placed on my heart. And before we jump in to the reading of God's Word and before we dive into the message, I want to give honor where honor is due. You know, some things that are done in private need to be celebrated in public. Amen? And I want to celebrate the man of God, the leader of this house, my leader, Pastor Jason Smith. I want to thank you, Jason. It's not very often that you find a leader of a church or a leader of a house or a leader of a home that doesn't just push you beyond what you think you're capable of, but takes your hand and walks with you side by side and pours into you and prepares the way, so to speak. And that's what you've done in my life. And so I'm definitely not who I am. I couldn't be who I am without you in it. And so I praise God for the man of God you are in private and in public. Absolutely. You know, and I'll tell you guys as a church body and watching online, be careful what you say to God. Be careful what you pray, because sometimes that comes back to bite you in the tail, so to speak. But earlier this week, that morning I was doing my quiet time before Jesus and I was journaling and I was praying and I just really felt his spirit tell me, Christina, I need you to say yes to me today. Whatever it is that I ask you, I just need you to say yes. And so in my prayer time that morning, in my journal time, I told God that. I said, Jesus, whatever you require of me today, I say yes. Well, in my finite mind, I thought, okay, maybe that's praying with one of my patients at the dental office. Maybe that's paying for the person behind me at the drive through Maybe that's just giving an encouraging word to someone. But about an hour later after I said that, my phone rang, and it was Jason. And he said, you know, Christina, he said, Sunday is the beginning of the week where we kick off Reach Week. And Reach Week, for you guys that are new to us, is just a time where we get to go out in our community and we get to show the practical love of Jesus. And He said, I can't think of a better person to deliver a message from God for his people than you with you being over our outreach here at Latitude Church and our family group ministry. And automatically, I kind of stiffed on him and I said, whoa, 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 I don't think so. I said, I've got a really busy week at the dental office. I've got she night coming up on Friday. I I have a lot of things to get prepared for reach week and I just don't think that it's going to happen. And gently... I heard the whisper of God in that still small voice because guess what? God still speaks. We learned that last week, right? And I heard that gentle voice, not a condemning voice, not a voice that slapped me upside the head. It was just that gentle whisper that said, Christina, remember this morning you said you were going to say yes to me. And so I picked up the phone. I called Jason back and I said, I'm not sure how it's going to work out, but I'm going to be obedient. And I say yes to preparing a message and to delivering it to God's people today. So I am thrilled to be here. And I'm expectant. I have a heart of expectancy for all that he's going to do in your life because he sure has done a lot for me. So if you have your copy of God's Word, would you pick it up right now? Would you turn with me? And if you don't, that's totally okay. It's going to be on the screens for us this morning. Will you turn with me to the first book of the Bible, Genesis And we're going to read starting in verses chapter 24 and starting in verses 17. It says, the servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my Lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all the camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it has the ability to change, to speak, 
to transform, to encourage, to convict. And so, Father, I pray that I would be your servant today, Lord, that has no agenda at all but to point people to you and to prepare the way for others to encounter you. So, Jesus, I pray that you would remove me, Father, that I would be in the shadow, that you would take the spotlight, that you would take center stage today, and, Lord, that you would do the speaking because, Lord, we rest and we need the power of Almighty God in our life. And so, Father, I just pray for any person under the sound of my voice or watching online, Jesus, that says, I just need to hear from them. I need to know that I am enough. I need to know that God can use me. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just so speak to their hearts today. Father, thank you that we have been ushered into the presence of you. Father, we are in the courts of you this morning, Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you would be glorified, that you would be honored in all that is said to done in your house today. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. A few years ago, my family had the great opportunity to visit the mountains of North Carolina. And it was the winter. It was a really cold and blistery couple of days, and we loved that opportunity to be able to get away sometimes and unwind. And that blistery night before um, definitely laid out a lot of ice and frost. Might be kind of good right now with our 110-degree weather, right um, outside with the heat index, kind of like when you walk out the door, Jack, and your glasses immediately fill up with, with fog. Jack from California said, what is this this week? And that's the humidity of, of North Carolina. So anyhow, this was a really, really cold and blistery day, and I'm not sure if we had a little bit of cabin fever or what, but we had decided as a family that we were going to go on a hike that morning, and so we bundled up, and we got all our stuff together, and we set out through the woods to grandmother's house we go. Just kidding, we didn't really go to grandmother's house, but we definitely had to go down the mountain for this hike. Well, upon exploring, Jason had picked up this really large stick, not really sure what he had in mind, not sure if he thought that he was going to scare some bears away or whatever, but he had this stick, this stick never, nevertheless. Um, but anyhow, so Jason kind of led the pack. He was in front, and we kind of all followed suit. But going down the mountain, there were lots of very icy limbs that were hanging over. There were some slippery and unstable terrain. There were trees that had fallen on the path where we kind of couldn't cross, but by the time that I got to that point in the path, the time that the family got to that point in the path, it had kind of all been cleared. It had been prepared, so to speak, because Jason had done the necessary work to lay the groundwork so that we could cross over, so that we could experience God and all his goodness out there, so that we could snap pictures and make memories, and so that we could just have a great time as a family. But friend, that is exactly what you and I get to do for Jesus, for others, and even for ourselves. The name of today's message is Prepare the Way. You see, did you hear me? I said that we get to do because God wants you to know this morning that he wants to use you to prepare the way. And I need someone to hear that this morning because I know for a long time, possibly even this morning, you're under the understanding that God can't use you and that he doesn't want to use you. But I need somebody to know this morning that even you, even despite your insecurities, even despite your past, even despite what you're thinking right now, that God wants to use you to prepare the way. So how do we prepare the way, you might ask, for the Lord? How do we prepare the way for others? And how do we prepare the way for even ourselves? And that's the question that we're going to try to unpack this morning. I think we first have to get up and set out. Number one, we have to get up and set out. You and I have to set out. You and I have to start somewhere. You and I have to make the conscious decision every morning to get out of bed. You and I have to make the conscious decision sometimes several times a day to get out of a negative headspace. Just the other day, Jason was sitting at the house and he said, you know, Christina, I was kind of starting to feel down. I felt myself kind of getting negative. And so he had to make the conscious decision to get up, to set out for a walk. And when he came back from that walk, he was in a better headspace. So you and I have to do the same. We have to set out on purpose and calling. In other words, start where you are, 
Use what you have and do what you can. You might want to write that down. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. We read earlier about an encounter in Genesis between a servant and a girl. You see, this servant was sent by Abraham to go ahead of him and to pick a bride for his son. And so the servant, it says in Scripture, was the most trusted servant that Abraham had. He set out. There were some prerequisites that the servant had prayed for that God would show him because God speaks, right? That would be able for him to choose the bride for his son Isaac. And so we pick up the story at the well. That's where we pick up this story where the servant is actually meeting the girl, and the girl's name is Rebecca. There's some interesting factors about Rebecca that I found. But I think the most distinguishing factor that God showed me wasn't really her beauty, but it was her willingness to set out and to get up. You see, Rebecca had a willingness to go to a place where she would encounter people. That place was the well. And, you know, she possibly knew that there might be somebody that just needed a sip of water. The servant found Rebecca at the water well. Where can others find you? I'm going to let that question just kind of sink in a little bit. Where can others find you? You know, you might say, well, that was her job to draw water from the well, and you're absolutely right. Every day, the, the girl, Rebecca, would go to that water well to draw water for her family day in and day out. She might have even been a stay-at-home mom. But I, what I love about this story so much was that in her going, in her normal work day, she didn't miss it. In our going, there is someone who is begging for a sip of water. She didn't miss an opportunity to prepare the way for someone and will later find out actually prepared the way for herself. But just in case you aren't convinced that God used Rebecca to prepare the way. I'm going to take us to another story in the Bible, and this is the story of Ruth that might be familiar to you. So if you will, if you'll turn to Ruth chapter 2, starting in verse 2, it says, One day Ruth, the Moabite foreigner, said to Naomi, which was her mother-in-law, I'm going to work. I'm going out to glean among the sheaves, following after some harvester who will treat me kindly. Naomi said, Go ahead, dear daughter. And so she set out. There's those words again. She went and started gleaning in a field, following in the wake of her harvesters. Ruth had made up her mind. She said, I'm going. I'm setting out. I'm getting to work. She started somewhere. She didn't wait. She didn't wait to be asked. She didn't ride on the sacrifices of those that had gone before her. And if you don't know anything about Ruth, I want to share a few interesting facts about Ruth because I believe there's someone in the building that might can relate. You know, sometimes we think of these Bible characters like Ruth as some super saint. But you know, Ruth has, has gone through a lot of stuff just like you and I have. You see, Ruth lost her husband. Ruth lost her father-in-law. Ruth was in a foreign land. So I think if anybody had the right to make excuses and to stay down, it probably was Ruth. And I just want to challenge somebody this morning. Like maybe you've gone some experiences like Ruth have, but God doesn't intend you to stay down. He intends you to get up and to set out because the best days are ahead of you. And he wants to use you to prepare the way for someone else. So Ruth made up in her mind, despite the fear, you know, there probably was a lot of fear there. Ruth was in an unknown land. She had lost a lot. There might have been just some fear there, but she didn't let that hold her back. She made up in her mind to set out. Where was she going, she, you might ask this morning? And that leads us to point number two in how we need to prepare the way. We need to, number two, enter the field. Ruth went out and set out into the field. She entered the field, followed in the wake of the harvesters. And let me stop right there and kind of unpack this a little bit. A couple of weeks ago, Jason and I, after church one Sunday, after he had preached a couple of messages, he kind of likes to just chill and unwind. And we went over to some friend's house, and they happened to have a jet ski. And they were like, hey, guys, do y'all want to ride the jet ski? And absolutely, Jason volunteered to ride the jet ski. And let me just, let me just say something. Mine and Jason's experiences of riding a jet ski are way different. And I've already been on a jet ski with Jason before, so I already kind of knew where this was going to go. And so I said, look, I'm willing to ride the jet ski. I want to ride the jet ski. I want to take in the sights. I want to feel the, the wind on my face. But you can't go fast. 
because that scares me half to death. Jason's idea of riding a jet ski is the faster the better, the dangerous the better, and Christina is a girl who kind of likes to stay in parameters. She likes to follow rules. She doesn't like to go fast. She likes to play it safe. And so Jason graciously agreed that he would keep it in eco-friendly mode and not put it in sport mode and that he would go slow. But this day, the waters were kind of rough. The waves kind of were pretty, pretty high because there was a lot of activity on the waters. There was a lot of boats and jet skis kind of coming on. So no matter how safe he tried to play it, no matter how slow he tried to go, it was just rough. And so he probably felt my panic a little bit. And so being the great man of God that he is, he did something, guys, that just blew me away. He recognized that there was a boat in front of us. And so what he did is he followed in the wake of that boat. He followed in the wake because he knew where that boat was going is where we wanted to go. He knew that that direction that that boat was going is where we want to go. But he knew in the wake of that boat was safety, in the wake of that boat was smooth waters, and the wake of that boat is where we wanted to be. And I just want to tell someone in the house this morning or watching online that I know there might be fear. You've been down long ago. And so I just want to tell you, follow in the wake of those that have gone ahead of you. There's people in your life that have gone ahead of you that have laid the path straight. There's people in your life like Jason that has cleared that path, has prepared it. So follow in the wake of the harvesters. And that's all that Ruth was doing. She knew she was going to set out and get out. She knew she was going to enter that field. But she also, in scripture tells us, she followed in the wake of the harvesters. She went to work. The fields that God has placed us in And guys, the field, there's many fields. Your home is a field. Your workplace is a field. This community is a field. The coffee shop is a field. The field that God places us in are the amazing opportunities that you and I get to have to get to work and to be a blessing. Even this week, during Reach Week, there's opportunities that you and I get to partner together, get to join arms together, and to be a blessing for Jesus. You see, the fields before us are often the places of opportunity. Ministry is in the confines of this church walls. And if you've been around Latitude any time, we say that over and over and over again because we want you to get it. This is where we come to the house of God. Our planting is here. But we come here to be scattered out into the marketplaces, into our cities and communities, to be a blessing and to get to work. Ruth said, I'm going to work out in the field, and I'm going out to glean, to collect, to harvest. In other words, in the Amplified Version, is that it says that she picked up leftover grain. Maybe we can kind of say it like this. She picked up some diapers for Epic Pregnancy Center. Maybe we can say she went and bought some shoes for the children at J.T. Barber and Oaks Road Elementary School who are less fortunate. Maybe she decided to give blood a simple act of service this week to save lives. But anyhow, she said, I'm picking up some leftover grain that might feel worthless and useless. But I know in my picking up, God's going to use me to prepare the way. You know, Rebecca's field, figuratively, was that water well. Rebecca quickly, it says in Scripture, lowered the jar to her hands and gave the servant a drink. But I'm I'm impressed with the fact that she did so, so quickly. She didn't make a lot of inquiries. She didn't ask a lot of questions like Christina does sometimes. She didn't make a lot of excuses. But it simply says that she met a need, and not only did she meet a need, she went above and beyond the need, and it even said that she cared for his camels. According to the National Geographic, it says that a camel can drink 30 gallons of water in 13 minutes. The servant had 10 camels, and there's a lot of smart people in the room, and I'll let you guys do the math. But what this tells me is that Rebecca didn't maybe see the dawning task ahead of her. She knew that one jar at a time, one trip to the well at a time, she was going to be used and she was equipped to meet a need. And I have to say, this morning, I believe there's some people in the room, and I need to speak to you this morning. I believe there's some people in the room that are looking at this dawning task ahead of you, and I'm praying that God changes your perspective. I believe there's some moms in the room this morning that sees that they're having to make a decision for their children in school next year, and it looks like a dawning task ahead of you. But I just want to remind you this morning that God's equipped you, that he's anointed you, and that you're going to see this dawning task ahead of you as an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus to your children because the task ahead of you could be the very thing 
that show, showcases God's glory. Let me say that again. The task ahead of you that you've been dreading, the task ahead of you that's caused you sleepless nights, the task ahead of you could be the very thing that showcases God's glory. I want to take us back to the end of that scripture that we first read. It says, without saying a word, without the servant saying anything, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. People are watching us. They're not saying a word. They're watching how we pass them by and not show the love of Jesus. They're watching how we're rude to them at the drive through They're watching how we have the answers of life and we're not willing to share it. They're not saying a word, but through that watch and through their listening, they're seeing if the glory of God is going to be showcased. You know, what field is near you that you can enter? What water well do you often frequent? Is it the coffee shop? Is it being more of an influence in your workplace? Is it possibly Habitat for Humanity this week when you know that God's gifted you and you have skills and you might can strike a hammer? Is it your local church that you've been sitting on the sidelines and God has been whispering you for enter that field? I want to challenge you and encourage you just like I'm doing myself this morning that don't just see the field, but go ahead and enter that field because it's in the field that point number three, we get to fulfill our duty. When you fulfill your duty... God can fulfill your destiny. When you fulfill your duty, it's possible that God's going to fulfill your destiny. You see, because both Rebecca and Ruth, if you finish reading the rest of the stories, end up meeting men of God that God brings into their life. But they didn't meet men of God sitting on the sidelines. They met men of God in the field. Their destiny was fulfilled in the field. You see, Rebecca was taken to a field where she met Isaac, it says in Genesis 24, 62, Now Isaac had come from Beer Larue, for he was living in Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? You see, your start and gathering will eventually land you in just the right spot. Ruth getting into that field, entering that field, her gathering, her start, ended her in just the right spot. She was able to be in the right field at the right time when God brought Boaz into her life. You never know what the extra will lead to in God's plan. You see, Rebecca never knew that her extra mile attitude and not just fulfilling her duty to to give the servant a drink of water, but also fulfilling the duty to go above and beyond and serve the camels as well. Would, she didn't ever know that that would land her in the lineage of Jesus. Because you see, Rebecca not only became a bride to Isaac, but she also became a mother to Jacob, and that landed her as a grandmother in the 12 tribes of Israel. She was in the line of Jesus. Her influence all started with a simple act of service. Your influence doesn't start with something important you do in the future. Your influence starts with being obedient today. Your influence doesn't start with something huge and important that you think you're going to do in the future. Your influence starts with being obedient today. You see, there's a 10-year-old little girl in this house who understands this concept. This week she called me and she said, Miss Christina, I believe that God's called me to start a family group. And I was like, okay. Okay. And I said, okay, Reagan, tell me a little bit more about that. And she said, I said, what does that look like to you? And she said, you know, I believe that I want to help children, help girls, 8 to 12 years of age. She was very specific. Learn the love of Jesus. Know the impact that they can have in this community for Jesus. And what I love about that is that, Reagan, you get it. You're not starting until you're 35 years old to know the influence that God has in your life until you say, God, here I am, use me for ministry. You're being obedient today. Your influence starts today. And guys, if a 10-year-old little girl can do that, what's holding us back from the influence that God has placed on every single one of our lives? I'm not selective. God does, God's not selective. He doesn't just choose the qualified and the called because He's the one that qualifies us and He's the one that calls us. 
Ruth never knew that her willingness to set out and get out and her obedience to enter the field and get to work would land her in the neighborhood of Jesus. When you and I choose to not be held back any longer, when you and I choose to embrace the possibilities that lie ahead and see ourselves as women and men who are called by God and for God and we're called to prepare the way for others, we will then hike down that mountain ahead of people, clear the way, and lay the groundwork for others to meet Jesus. You see, the same camels that Rebecca gave a little drink of water to, or a whole lot of drink of water to, because it says that they drank until they were, were done drinking, became the same camels that she rode to enter the field to her destiny. The same camels that she served were the same camels that were carrying her now. You know, when I think of my life, I can get pretty emotional of the people that have literally prepared the way for me. And I know as I'm saying this, maybe you're sitting there contemplating and thinking of this, the people that have prepared the way for you. Those people that have literally prayed me into the kingdom. Those people that have encouraged me and have believed in me when I didn't believe in myself and called out giftings inside of me when I didn't even see them. Those people that served me when I didn't even have the strength to muster up to be served. You know, this past week, I was able to watch a movie that I would challenge all of y'all to watch, and it's Harriet. It's the life of Harriet Tubman. I think she got this concept. I think she got this. Because on her deathbed, her final words were, I go to prepare a place for you. The same words as Jesus. And she didn't just say those words because they were nice and fluffy words. It was what she lived by. It was who she was. It was her mission. And guys, it challenged me because, family, I just want to tell you, I think we have some work to do. Because more than ever, there are people around us that are hurting and need to see the love of Jesus that you and I so have. If you don't believe me, go look on Pastor Jason's Facebook this week when he posed the question on social media and says, what's holding you back from getting to church? And guys, Jason didn't even know that he was entering a field this week where he could um, help to heal some wounds where he was able to be a listening ear for so many people that are hurting. And I want to tell you, and I want to tell myself, let's get up and set out. Let's enter the fields around us and let's fulfill our duty. And as a result, we will prepare the way for others. So what is our response? I believe that there might be some Rebecca's and Ruth's, maybe some Nathan's and some John's who need to get up. You've been down too long. You've been in that slumber too long. You've let life circumstances kind of knock you off your feet. But I want to tell you that God's got an assignment for you and there's somebody that needs a sip of water that's going to meet you at that water well, that's going to meet you in that field. What field is set before you that you need to enter this week? And you might say, you know what, Christine, I've already done that. I've already got up. I've already set out. I've already entered the field. But I sure don't have an extra mile attitude. I'm sure not going above and beyond. I'm kind of looking at it as this daunting task that so overwhelms me. I want to tell you that you have the capacity by the Spirit of God to have that extra mile attitude. You have the capacity to serve others and go above and beyond what you can do. You know, a friend told me this week, and I want to hang on to this. It's, it's not enough to say, God, what do you want for me? I think we should rephrase that and say, God, what do you want from me? And so if we can right now, can we just all stand to our feet as we get ready to respond to what God has spoken to your heart? I want to tell you this morning that maybe you're in this place or maybe you're watching us online and you say, you know what, Christina? I can't prepare the way for others because I really don't even have a relationship with Jesus. And I want to tell you that that's your first step. Because if anybody was an example of preparing the way, it was Jesus. He actually went to the cross on your behalf. You know, it cost God a lot. It cost Him His only Son. And I think if, if Jesus can go to the cross for us and save us and give us a relationship, not a religion, I think that the least we can do is give Him our heart. And so if you're in the building today and you say, you know what, I haven't given God my heart. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I think that's your first step. And if you've done that today, great. But what field is God calling you to enter? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, 
If you fall into that first category and you say, you know what, Christina, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I haven't given him my heart. I understand now that he prepared the way for me. He uncovered those slippery places. He's He's cleared the way. He's prepared the way. And I want to give Him my heart today. If that's you with nobody looking, can you just raise your hand to say, I say yes to Jesus. I give Him my heart today. Is there anybody in the building? Is there anybody online that says that? Right where you are in the quiet of this moment, can you say, dear Jesus, I give you my heart. I thank you, Jesus, that you went ahead of me. You led the way for me. Even when I didn't even know it, Father, you were uncovering things. Jesus, you were knocking down trees. You were, you were setting the groundwork, Father, for me to know you. And today, Jesus, I give you my heart. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for me. Thank you for dying for me. And today I say yes to you. And maybe you've done that and you fall into the, to the second category. I believe that I'm standing in a room of faith-filled people, people that are entering fields. And so if we can, can we just, if you feel comfortable, just raise your hand to Jesus and just say, here I am, God, send me. Use me in the fields that you're going to open for me this week. Father, help me to serve people. Help me to love people. Help me to give people a sip of water. Father, today I'm not sitting any longer. I'm getting up and I'm setting out. I'm entering the field. Jesus, I'm not seeing it as a dawning task, Lord, where they're asking me to do something else. But Father, I'm seeing it as an opportunity, Jesus, that you want to use me to prepare the way. And Father, by doing that, I'm going to fulfill my duty that you've placed on my life. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, that we get to serve you. Father, it's not an obligation, but it's an opportunity. And I thank you, Father, that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces. And Father, no matter where you take us, Father, we say yes to you. And we thank you, Father, for what you're doing. In Jesus' most precious name.